Hey. Welcome to uh, yeah, part two of the series, as James has already said, where we're looking at um, some of the attributes of God. And first up, can I say if you missed Vary's excellent introduction uh, last week to the series um, and, and the talk last series, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. Um, why are we doing this? Well, to again quote A.W. Tozer, who's, whose book, uh, The Knowledge of the Holy, um, here's a copy, um, has been something of an inspiration of this series. Uh, the man or woman who comes to a right belief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. And uh, being beset, as we currently are, by a number of rather large temporal problems, uh, a bit of relief would be a welcome thing, don't you think? And the aspect of God's nature that we're looking at tonight is God's limitlessness or his infinitude. God unlimited, we're calling it. And uh, there's an irony to me preaching this topic at the end of a week where I have been more than usually aware of my own limitations. Um, hashtag homeschool traumas. And then there's the challenge of, of attempting to address the limitlessness of God within a, t a limited 20-minute window. Uh, you know, by definition, there is a huge amount to cover here, um, but I'm going to try and give it my best shot. So the first thing I think we have to ask with this topic is why bother trying to get our heads around it in the first place? I mean, Tozer says that of all of God's attributes, one is the one that's most difficult to grasp, and, uh, and trying to do it will always end in failure. God is so much greater, so much bigger than our minds can possibly conceive that our attempts are always going to fall short. So we can only imagine a limited God. But if we settle for the picture of God that we already have, then we end up, he says, with a God who can never surprise us, can never overwhelm us, not astonish us, nor transcend us. And that's just not you know, God, is it? So we have to keep pursuing a bigger understanding of God. And here's why. Because the almighty, limitless, infinite, eternal God chose to make us and reveal himself to us. And he wants to make his presence known in your life today. And there's always more of him to discover. Now, Vary mentioned the Chronicles of Narnia last week, um, which my kids are mad for at the moment. And uh, in one of the stories, I forget which one it is, Lucy says, Aslan, you're bigger than before. And Aslan says, that's because you're older. And Lucy says, not because you're older. And Aslan says, I'm not any older. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And at the start of 2021, it's impossible to know what's going to happen. Just imagine where we were this time last year. You know, we, we wouldn't have a clue what's going to happen in this year. Will this year be better or worse than last year? Well, either way, there is an invitation for each of us, from the youngest to the oldest, for those who call themselves followers of Jesus and for those who haven't yet taken that step to discover more of God and for our relationship with him to grow and deepen this year. Okay, so where do we start? Well, we start with what we know, or at least what we think we know. We, we start with ourselves and our very obvious limitations. If you've got one, please grab your Bible, and we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 40. Now, I used to love the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, as a kid, I loved sporting records. Uh, I loved watching world records fall. Um, but in lots of records, I guess particularly I'm thinking of the 100 meters, uh, you know, sprint, men and women's sprint. And with the notable exception of Usain Bolt, the times coming down is limited to the odd hundredth of a second here and there. Will we as humans continue to get faster? Probably. Will a human ever manage to run the 100 meters in under a second? Probably not. I doubt it, because we're limited. And that's not just limited to our bodies. We're seeing, aren't we, in nature at the moment, how much 
Uh, there, there are limits to how much man-made stuff the atmosphere and the oceans can absorb. Unlimited broadband. Now, there's an interesting promise that has not been fulfilled, uh, certainly in the last few weeks. Nando's refills may be unlimited, but my stomach... And the fact that my stomach... And the fact that most of you are watching this tonight from home, uh, tonight in lockdown, rather than being here in the building, I think illustrates the point best of all. We are subject to limits in every area. We're not good at dealing with that. Tozer puts it like this. We poor human creatures are constantly being frustrated by limitations imposed on us from without and within. He wrote that in 1920. He could have just as easily been talking about 2020. And for all our efforts to push the limits, which, by the way, was something God commanded people to do from the beginning, you know, some growth is good, we are reminded daily that we are not enough. We fall short. And like I say, this has been a great week for me to be reminded of that. So that's us. Let's talk about God. Now, Isaiah 40 uh, is, is the kind of the beginning of the second half of the book of Isaiah. It's written from the perspective of the far side of the defining national disaster of the Old Testament, the exile of Israel in Babylon. And after being sort of kicked around and kidnapped by the surrounding nations, God has brought his people back home. But after 70 years in foreign lands, Israel is traumatized and has lost its sense of identity. And to address the trauma, God speaks first words of comfort and words of hope. That's verses 1 to 11. And then to remind them who they are, he tells them about who he is. And that's the reading that we heard from verse 12. Very quickly, let's just flick through a few verses. Um, follow along if you've got your Bible. Verse 12, the hollow of his hand. Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens. This is uh, poetic language saying God is big on an unimaginable scale. Verse 14. Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? And that's saying there is no comparison to God in terms of uh, knowledge and wisdom. Verse 17. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are guarded by him as worthless and less than thing. I'm worthless and less than thing. I'm saying, if you take any power structures, any political systems, any nations that seem powerful and important and compare them to God, well, they just seem totally insignificant and weak and temporary. And and if you have time, you could go through the whole passage and see uh, you know, all the things that are said about God and see uh, you know, all the things that are said about God uh, that set him apart from anything in creation. People and nations and mountains and stars and the heavens and the earth and space. We who have used our developing understanding of the sheer scale of the universe to help explode our sense of God's magnitude, help explode our sense of God's magnitude, his hugeness. Uh, in a brilliant talk that I put a, a link for uh, below in the description for this video, he talks about the star-breathing God who speaks the cosmos into being. He points out that light travels around 5.88 trillion miles a year. So that's a light year, 5.88 trillion miles. And that's the speed, if you like, of light coming out of God's mouth. And he talks about stars that are just big, that the Earth's entire orbit around the sun would be contained, would fit inside them. And it's really powerful imagery. Take a look later and have your mind blown. You know, Chris Whitty said about the coronavirus pandemic earlier this week, if you're not shocked by the scale of this, then you haven't understood it at all. I think that's a good way of putting it. If you're not blown away by the hugeness of what we know about the universe and the implications for our understanding about God, then you haven't understood it at all. Next slide, please. Sorry. But the truth is, there is a limit to 
this approach of thinking about God in terms of size, because infinite doesn't just mean a lot, and limitless doesn't just mean bigger. It means that God is beyond all measurement. The gap between the biggest thing we can think of and the smallest is nothing to the difference between God and everything else. That's another Tozer quote. And then he says this, Our concepts of measurement embrace mountains and men, atoms and stars, gravity, energy, numbers, and speed, but never God. This is how Hilda Bear, Archbishop of Tours, put it nearly 1,000 years ago. God is above all things, under all things, outside all, within but not enclosed, without but not excluded, above but not raised up, below but not depressed, wholly above presiding, wholly beneath sustaining, wholly within filling. Remember this time last year when we were looking at Colossians, you know, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Colossians 1.17, which brings us neatly on to Jesus. So let's talk about Jesus. So the thing about doing all the God is big stuff is that it only addresses one aspect of God's limitlessness. Did you know a single coronavirus is 0.85 atograms in size, which is 0. then 18 zeros, 85 of a gram. So taking the estimated viral load of 70 billion coronaviruses in an infected person, multiply that by all the cases suspected in the world, um, then the total estimated weight of this coronavirus in humans worldwide ever is about 30 grams, which is about the weight of this battery. 30 grams of coronavirus has been more than enough to kill millions and wreak, ha wreak havoc on this planet. A tenth of this in total would probably be enough to infect every single human being on this planet. So making it all about size is in fact a limited way of talking about an unlimited God. Of talking about an unlimited God. Think about Jesus and the idea that a limitless God was born as a human baby and cradled in Mary's arms. And that's been a bit of a mind bake uh, for since the early days of the church. Mind bake uh, for since the early days of the church. Philippians 2 famously talks about Jesus emptying himself, making himself nothing to be born on the earth. And the, the key question is, is what did it mean for Jesus to empty himself? How do we reconcile the idea of an unlimited and unlimitable God taking on some form of limit? Because it just doesn't work reduced in some way. Back to Colossians again, chapter 2, verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of God lives in bodily form. And uh, we could spend a long time talking about this. It's a fascinating topic. I just want to share two key ideas which I think are helpful. So the first is to think that it's a lot more accurate to think of the incarnation as an addition of human, of human attributes to God rather than a loss of divine attributes. Just think about that for a moment. And then second, when we look closely at Philippians 2, we see that it's not divine qualities of God that Jesus surrenders, it's equality with God. It's a status thing. Jesus temporarily gave up some of that status of God, of being God, and took on, this is verse 7, the very nature of a servant. So the thing that makes our God so great is that the only one who can put any sort of limitation on God is God himself. And Jesus, the eternal, the unlimited word, chose to limit his status out of love for you. That's the only way God can be limited, by his own choice, on his own terms, for our sake. Which brings us back to us and what this all means for us. You know, there's a relationship between God's limitlessness and our limitedness. 
And right from the, the start of the story, we see humans trying to break free of the good limits that God has placed over them and over his creation. And the consequences of that were devastating, and they're devastating today. And one of the problems that we've made by reducing God down, limiting him, if you like, in our minds, is that we can on a burden that we weren't designed to carry. Louis Giglio puts it like this, when we shrink God down, we pass ourselves up. And the problem with that, we all discover that we are not God, and we never could be God, and we never could be God. And many of us live in denial of that, some of all our lives. But sooner or later, something comes along that shows us that we are not God. And living in denial of that fact is as futile and dangerous as those who live in denial of COVID-19. In fact, it's more futile and dangerous. A lot of people are feeling quite disillusioned at the moment, I think. And I, I can't remember who said it recently, but being disillusioned is, by definition, a good thing. When you think about it, it means being freed from false securities that we, we, we trust to comfort and sustain us, which ultimately... And we could talk about the wider cultural trends that we know better than God and can create a better way than God's way and how increasingly obvious it is this thinking is bankrupt. Just look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. But really, I want to leave this on a more personal level tonight. So here are three thoughts. First, we have to recognize and accept our limitations. This is essential to our well-being and our health evening. This is uh, Ruth Haley Barton. When we refuse to live within limits, we are refusing to live with a basic reality of human existence. There is a finiteness to what I do in this body. There is a finiteness to how many relationships I can engage in meaningfully at one time. There is a finiteness to time, how many hours there are in a day, how many days there are in a week, and how much can be done in those blocks of time. There is a finiteness to my energy. There comes a time when I am tired. There comes a time when I am sick. There comes a time when I am injured. There are times when I am reminded that I am human, a finite being living in the presence of an infinite God. God is the infinite one. God is the one who can be all things to all people. God is the one who can be all places at once. God is the one who never sleeps. I am not. How good is that? And, and how desperately we need to be reminded of that today. Secondly, we need to remember that God is unlimited and God is love. So God's love is unlimited. Your sin may be great. You may think that your sin is very great. But however great it is, your sin is finite. Which means God's infinite love will make small work of it. Your sin is no match for God's infinite love. Have no doubt about that. Repent and believe. And there is nothing that can separate you from God's limitless love. Third, in the difficult times, and boy, are these some difficult times, when we discover that we, we can draw on God's unlimited power and strength. And I want to finish tonight by just returning more time to Isaiah chapter 40. And after 26 verses reminding his people, um, coming out of exile, who he is, and in the light of that, who they are, God speaks to them in their place of trauma and distress. And these are famous words. And I just wonder, can, can we have them up on the screen and, and maybe we just read these out together. So this is from verse 27. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know 
Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We're limited, but God is not limited. We have the infinite love of the infinite God. We will experience the unlimited resurrection life because the same limitless power that raised Christ dead lives in us because we worship an unlimited God. So let's pray. Just as praying before the uh, service, there were just a, a few things I uh, felt the Lord put on my heart that I, I just wanted to pray into um, as we come out of this talk. And the first one was um, just a word saying, just make a little more room. And uh, I'm, I'm, I think maybe it's the answer to the question, okay, but what do I do about this? You know, and we can think of these huge grand concepts and these ideas and these uh, perspectives on God and just think, well, where do I go with that? And um, one answer there was just make a little more room. And maybe that's something for you tonight to reflect on. What does it look like to make a little more room for God tonight or in this week? Um, the second one was a, was a word uh, to... Um, offer to people a chance to break free from, from a sense of addiction. And it, and it was kind of linked up with this idea of, of letting it go and, and letting it grow. So um, in the same way that we, we need to sort of let go of some of our ideas of God so that they can grow, um, we, there are things in our lives that we need to let go of so that we can grow. So perhaps that's you. We're going to pray for you in a minute. And then the third area was just... Or, before the, the beginning of the next week, you just feel like you need to see a sense of God's goodness. You need a sense of God's goodness. And it, it just reminded me of, um, I think it's Exodus 33, when Moses is, is um, uh, sort of before the Lord, and, and he, he asked to see God's glory. And, and God says, um, you're not going to see my glory, but you're going to see my goodness. I'll make my goodness pass before you. And I just think maybe that's for some of us tonight who... Um, just need to see God's goodness a little more in need of that. And of course, that doesn't mean, doesn't make for a comfortable life. Moses was out in the middle of the desert and in the wilderness when that happened. So he wasn't very comfortable, um, but God showed him his goodness. And I just think that's for some of us tonight. So um, let me just pray into those things and I'll, I'll hand back over to James and the band. So maybe just close your eyes. Open your heart. You might want to reflect that in your body language, putting your hands out or putting your hand on your heart, perhaps. We pray, come Holy Spirit, come minister to us now. So firstly, I just want to pray for those who tonight are wondering where, where to go with this, where to take their thinking, where to take their lives from this point. And these words, just make a little more room. Father, would you come now with inspiration to show people how they can make more room for you, to show us how we can make more room 
for you in our lives, even in little ways in this week ahead. Would you make that possible, Lord? Some people, life just feels so squeezed at the moment. Would you just show where the little opportunities, the doors are, um, the invitations are to make a little more room for you this week? So if that's you, may the Lord bless you in this week. May you know more of him this week as you make a little more room for him. Secondly, Lord, I pray for those um, who are feeling trapped, uh, maybe in a sense of addiction or um, even, even addictive ways of thinking, how they are thinking about you. Lord, would you enable people now in the name of Jesus to let things go, to let it go and to move forward into new times of growth, into new times of growth, new times of freedom, new times of um, walking with you. And Lord, finally, just for those who are desperate for a taste of your goodness right now, in the midst of everything that's going on, as you did for Moses, would you pass by and pass by and show your goodness. Thank you that you are a good God. Come speak your goodness into people's hearts now.